I got a very good deal on a couple of solar panels to add to my little toy setup with the uh, Morningstar uh, TSMPPT60 uh, controller. Uh, however, when I hook them up, I notice the VOC, uh, open circuit voltage, is just a tad too high for the Morningstar to be happy. So it goes into over voltage protect and uh, stops doing anything as soon as the sun is shining mildly. Uh, and that's why I've constructed this. Uh, so, uh, on this heatsink we have very few things. And this is a uh, VOC uh, shunt uh, limiting uh, controller. Uh, what this thing does is it uh, turns on while the morning starts doing its uh, MPPT sweep and it limits the uh, open circuit voltage of the panels uh, to about 140 something volts. Uh, and uh, the way it does it is so super simple. Uh, it's got one big junk drawer, a power transistor from some amplifier, four uh, Zena diodes, three 36 volt ones and one 39 volt ones, and two dio uh, two uh, resistors in there as well, a 2k base resistor for the transistor and a 100k pull down for the base. We also have a uh, overheating a protection device which uh, goes across the base and emitter connectors so once the heatsink goes above uh, 85C uh, it'll just short out the base and emitter, the transistor will turn off, no more current will flow. Uh, if it's heating up because the transistor has broken uh, very shortly put a fuse, 2 amp fuse in series there. Uh, so let's uh, have a look at this thing in action. Oh, actually I think I have it uh, simulating on a PC right now. There you go, there you can see uh, how this actually works. So we can adjust our voltage to arrive there. As you see at 140, this is not completely accurate. But once we turn it up, the transistor turns on, current flows and it limits the voltage to uh, somewhere between VOC and VMPP. VMPP for my array is about 110 volts, so if we go down to 110, you see there's no current flowing at all through this circuit, so we're just shunting current really while the uh, MPP, MPP controller is doing its super quick sweep uh, of the panel voltage range. So if we hook this up to the power supply, we can have a look and see how it works. So we're hooked up, positive and negative. I think we have current monitoring there to the right. So let's uh, start turning off the voltage. If a fuse actually survived getting soldered, we'll soon find out. And it did. So once we get up to, what's that? About 140 volts, it starts to turn on and shunt some current. And the higher the voltage you go, the more current it will shunt. And it's a rather soft curve as well. Uh, because we really don't care uh, much about regulation at all. Uh, we just want this thing to make sure there's some load on the solar panels when the Morningstar controller stops drawing current. The only thing this thing is supposed to do is limit the peak voltage under no load conditions. And it seems to be doing that just fine. Uh, the heatsink also allows it to work reasonably well in fault conditions if the battery is full and it's kind of sitting at a high voltage when it should. It should be able to shunt uh, probably about 50 watts in decent airflow conditions. Uh, so let's uh, go downstairs, get this thing installed. I'm going to bet that it's sunny enough outside of the morning star is not going to be happy with us. Yeah, when it does be nothing in the alarms box that means it's uh, kind of triggering an alarm all the time you can see we have a regulator, regulator installed over the VOC is uh, 145 that's just not something the morning stars happy with because it will go over 150 volts and it turns off uh, at like 148 or so all right and we're now uh, installed i've got the shunt control just sitting on top of the morning star with the leads just going straight into and straight across the panel input there. Uh, we're measuring the voltage across the morning star uh, PV input. So uh, let's see what happens. Uh, when I uh, started this, it was turned off due to over voltage, so it should not 
uh, usual low down of the panels when we turn it on. Let's see what happens. And it does not low them down instantly. You saw the voltage was shunted to 143 volts there before it uh, dropped to our, our VMPP of uh, about 107 volts there. And uh, the regulator is working just fine. Our sweep VOC uh, is now a bad web design. Uh, it's now 143 volts, which is uh, within tolerances. So it's not just going to uh, turn off on us right away. Beautiful. So let's see how this thing performs in a couple of days. Uh, if it uh, does not trigger any uh, over voltage alarms, I'm just going to uh, mount this thing to the cabinet, probably just underneath that. And uh, Everything's going to be fine. If it does keep triggering, I'm going to have to replace one of the Xena diodes for one that slightly lower voltage still uh, to make it uh, a bit more aggressive in its shunting. Uh, and of course, we need to keep an eye on if uh, the fuse blows and probably gets better fuse hole than that, but you know, it's good enough. There's nothing more permanent than a temporary solution that works. Well, as you might expect, the first revision went on fire and is now in the trash, and this is revision two. Uh, so, a few things have changed, but not a lot. Uh, so, uh, the first one failed because it was too slow. The big bipolar uh, transistor just uh, did not turn on fast enough for the uh, MPPT controller to be happy. The panel voltage still spiked uh, very briefly uh, above the threshold voltage for it to turn off uh, and as such it turned off the voltage remained high the device kept clamping it uh, and the funnel of the transistor shorted and uh, the uh, uh, resistor burned up instead of a fuse of course uh, so uh, i've made some modifications the drive circuit is basically the same uh, I've just tweaked the values of the devices a bit. We have a uh, 100 ohm a gate resistor because this has turned into a MOSFET uh, and a 10k pull down. Uh, so this, these lower values, lower resistance devices should be able to uh, power this thing on uh, with a bit more force than uh, the previous def design could. Uh, I had to use a relatively high value for the base resistor for the bipolar one because we were using this little linear amplifier and uh, uh, it had to be able to regulate it within the confines of a Xena diode and uh, the resistor we had chosen, uh, etc. Uh, a flaw of that design was I only used one of these 43 ohm power resistors, uh, which meant that we had about 100 volts of voltage drop across the transistor which was, you know, almost a hundred watts of power being dissipated in it, which is not good. Transistors don't like having huge amounts of power uh, being pushed through them, and the isolation uh, from the heatsink was made of Kapton tape, so the thermal interface wasn't the best either. Uh, since I've gone with two of these uh, 43 ohm resistors in series, uh, we now can make do with about 30 volts of drop across this MOSFET. Uh, now, this is a random junk box uh, switch mode MOSFET. Uh, these do not like operating in the linear region. They will usually go on fire if you try. So I've made a bit of a quick connect there to make sure we can swap that out easily. Uh, assuming that our more properly mounted fuse actually blows, I'm going to put a 800 milliamp fuse in here this time. Uh, since uh, in normal operation, really, it's just going to see super short pulses of power being dissipated. If it sees continuous power at all, uh, it's a fault condition. It only needs to handle that for a few seconds while the, the controller starts regulating once you've turned on the panels. And uh, that generally should not happen because uh, you're uh, going to have this sitting around. It's going to be slowly activating with the sweeps of the controller does in the morning and uh, repeating that cycle every day. So... This really never should see continuous power in normal operation. Uh, so hopefully the 800 milliamp fuse is going to uh, not go on fire. What more? Uh, I've also beefed up the wiring a bit, put some thicker junk box stuff in there, and uh, 
I've got everything hooked up for a bit of a test. We've actually got 93 volts across there uh, while I'm poking around. And uh, I have tuned the xenodiode. The voltage is now, I believe, 135 volts ish, something like that. I think it's 433 volts in series. Um, uh, it, it's some value around 130 volts and as you can see if we turn this up uh, the transient for this de design keeping in mind we have a 16 ohm resistor in series uh, is uh, quite sharp compared to the old one uh, let's let's actually uh, diss the uh, series resistor just to demonstrate that right so now it's power supply straight into the uh, uh, over voltage here. clamp. So if we turn the fine down there and we go up to just a little limit, should be 136 volts ish. No, depends a bit on temperature. So we're at 137. Now, if we turn that up to max, we get to basically the full current. So we have about a volt from uh, no clamping to full clamping, which is about 10 times less than we had on the old one, which had uh, about 10 volts from minimum clamping to maximum clamping. Uh, so this uh, new design is much sharper. Hopefully that translates to a much quicker response as well, because as soon as it goes above 137 volts, depending on temperature, it's going to just slam on the brakes and start uh, dissipating some power. Uh, now, uh, the reason I've been testing with a, a big resistor in series uh, is because the impedance of a solar panel is relatively high. If I can put out about 9 amps and that's it, uh, my panel should have a system impedance of about 10 ohms, 10 to 15, that sort of range. So I've got a, an 8 ohm resistor in series just to more accurately be able to gauge uh, how this device is performing and if we have a look at the scope while we play with the voltage you can see we have the max measure down, down there at the bottom that's the actual current voltage if we slam it up to a maximum setting it never goes above 142 and uh, let, let's see if we can get that on camera if I twiddle the knob I can twiddle it quite a bit and the bar stays exactly the same because the device is clamping as it should. So uh, I'm going to install this above the controller right now and uh, hopefully it's uh, not going to be sitting there either with these guys destroyed or with this guy blown tomorrow when I get up. So part of what you pay for with the Morningstar controllers is the software. They have very, very good, in my opinion, uh, data logging capabilities. Uh, so uh, this morning when I was uh, setting up to do things I put this PC to log data from the Morningstar controller uh, with my little circuit in action and I'm quite happy about what we see. So this curve here is the uh, input power from my array uh, over the course of a day. Now it wasn't super sunny today, uh, hopefully it's going to be that way uh, in the upcoming days, but we did get a few peaks uh, up over 800 watts or so where it really w was having issues uh, performing earlier. Really, any time it went over 600 watts, uh, it would throw an, al uh, throw an alarm and uh, quit uh, setting my circuit on fire. However, I also logged uh, the faults and uh, I've cut a bunch of no alarms out of this log file. Uh, but uh, it will have just triggered the high array voltage current limiter a few times while it was doing the sweeps and never under normal operation. Uh, and that's a different uh, non-emergency uh, uh, alarm uh, than the one I was getting before where the controller would shut off. Uh, the high array voltage current limit uh, is just uh, a safe operating area uh, soft current limit. Uh, that just means it... Uh, during the sweep was not able to put out current, uh, which it wouldn't be doing anyway. It's basically just a false alarm, it doesn't mean anything. And it tripped a few times uh, just prior to uh, this graph beginning. Uh, well, if we're sitting at around like 700 watts or so, just in the area where the current, uh, the uh, circuit is working the hardest, where it's just about kind of tripping a little, but not quite going fully on. 
uh, it did not trip during any of the remainder of the logging time, which is um, about an hour or two, uh, including where it was uh, going up over a kilowatt of input power. So I'm very, very happy with that. However, uh, I did f uh, figure out uh, another issue that we are going to have to address, uh, because my battery uh, got fully charged right at the end of the day, uh, and uh, it was rather sunny by then, and uh, the controller was not using all the power from the solar panels. So the voltage was slowly creeping up as the battery current decreased, and uh, <laughs> I actually had to turn a few loads on to make sure the array voltage didn't start tripping the uh, over-voltage protection circuit by just not being loaded because the battery was full. So that is something we are going to have to deal with because a full battery uh, should not be a fault condition. Uh, part of the reason this controller is here is so that uh, in case the big inverter photovoltaic, photovoltaic uh, in proper system fails, we can still recharge the batteries uh, and uh, save ourselves from ruining them uh, just because we have no redundancy on the charging circuitry. Uh, and uh, my idea for some of this problem uh, is going to use a bit of wall space. Because uh, here in Finland, uh, heating is a very common thing people do. And if you go to the uh, second hand store, the flea market, uh, you can easily find old used electric radiators. Uh, 300 watts is a very common small size one you use for. Uh, bathrooms and stuff like that. We just need a little bit of heat in your house uh, and that should fit right here. So my plan is to go get a second hand 300 watt electric radiator. Uh, they would be drawing about 800-900 milliamps, would get a bit over 100 watts dissipated in that. Uh, and I'll put on a uh, slower, uh, another transistor with a slower turn on time uh, in this circuit, uh, so that uh, this uh, little tiny circuit needs to be compact in order to handle the very quick peaks it gets uh, while the uh, Morningstar controller is doing its uh, MPPT sweep. But if we end up in a situation where we have a sustained panel over voltage, uh, another transistor is just going to shunt current uh, to the wall mounted radiator, which can handle. 130 watts continuously, no problem, it's just gonna uh, heave the room up a bit, which isn't a problem since we have we have very good cooling in these walls. Uh, so I'm gonna take this uh, circuit out and uh, think about how to actually implement that. And implemented it, we have. Uh, so I went out looking for used wall-mounted proper radiators that are none to be found. Why? Because new ones are like 200 euros and no one's throwing them out or giving them away. That's completely stupid. Uh, so uh, I went to Klaus Olsen, bought a 25 euro standard, super cheap Chinese uh, freestanding unit, which uh, has some inaccessible uh, holes on the back, which we can use to wall mount it anyway. Uh, and this is perfectly suitable for our needs. Uh, and I've done some adaptations to all of this stuff in order to make this work. Uh, so, uh, this is rated a bit more uh, higher uh, than I wanted it to. We have ratings of 750 watts, 1250 and 2000 watts. And that's uh, divided up into two heaters, one on each side. And uh, even at the lowest 750 watt setting, it was like, uh, was it 70 something ohm? Was it four? Yeah, it was forty something ohm, uh, and it, that's just way too low. Uh, so what I've done is I've cut all the wiring up, uh, and I put the two heaters in series. We have a uh, one of a red red lead and one of a white lead going into the controller there, uh, and they're common together with this uh, neutral lead, which used to go straight to the neutral V power outlet. Uh, so we get about one hundred and twenty ohms total in this thing, which. It's 400-ish watts if you were to hook it straight to the mains, uh, which should be a really good value for this. 
because I noticed while I was running this thing uh, continuously, uh, with the 86 ohms we have in the original resistors, uh, the transistor would be having kind of a 30 volt-ish voltage to drop across it uh, during normal regulation, which is really, really not good. It's quite a lot of power to be dissipated in a switching fact. These do not like uh, working in the linear region. They get hot spots inside and they have a tendency to fail uh, due to internal overheating. Uh, they don't, don't even have a safe operating area specification because they are purely made for switching. Uh, so going up a bit in resistance would give us uh, less voltage to drop across this because we can drop more voltage across this because it's not drawing a bit more current than we really need it to. So this is like a 40% increase. It might not clamp quite hard enough. Uh, we're going to have to test it. Uh, but if this does work, uh, it's a really good solution because uh, I didn't have to implement any uh, extra fast and slow circuitry. I've, I've designed a proper circuit to do it with capacitors and resistors and stuff, which would add another transistor to this heatsink and some uh, timing stuff to make one fast one with these resistors and a slow one with a big resistor. But if uh, this can uh, act uh, fast enough, uh, we, we just don't need that and this circuit is going to be fine. Uh, so another addition here is uh, this little diode shoved in across the heater because this uh, thing, uh, it's as you can see a rather long string of wire that's just probably a, quite a few meters uh, and uh, when you disconnect this you get a blodder grade arc and uh, that would just set our MOSFET on fire instantly. So this is a PFC controller. Uh, uh, MOSFET, it's very fast, uh, 600 volt rated, so, uh, reverse biased across uh, the heater, so any when the MOSFET turns off, this is just going to act as a flyback diode and dissipate the energy. And I've done a bunch of like screwing with it, connecting it to 150 volt DC just violently, and it hasn't uh, gone on fire yet. Uh, if this works, I'm probably going to add, uh, drill a hole, and add uh, a red like active LED that's just uh, straight across the heater so we can see uh, if there's voltage across the heater when it's like charging the battery and the panel is not at the clamping voltage we'll know that the transistor has gone kaboom and the thing's stuck on forever because we don't need a fuse across this. This only dissipates uh, about uh, 180 watts-ish under full load and this is a 2 kilowatt heat, it can handle that continuously, no problem. Uh, so uh, yeah, uh, we only need an indicator to uh, show a failure, we don't need to have any any sort of uh, overcurrent protection. Uh, and indeed we have defeated all of the uh, protection circuits in this thing because this thermostat, it couldn't break 150 volts DC no matter how hard it tried. and. Uh, Maybe this thermal fuse could, and this thermostat would not either. Uh, but these are defeated because they're on the neutral line there. So they're just not in circuit. We, we're just connected to this side and not to that side of them. Uh, but it doesn't matter. Super low power. We're running this thing at like 5% of its rated power. Really no problem. So I'm going to uh, put this down uh, on top of the regulator and uh, we'll see if it A works and B survives. Alright, I'll let it sit uh, in production for an entire day, uh, letting the batteries just about get full enough to make this trigger ever so slightly burp them with the sunlight and it just got to do the continuous loading thing for the little tiniest bit but it didn't blow up. Uh, so I'm quite happy with the design we've come up with. I've done a couple of final modifications, well one uh, and uh, now I'm pretty confident in putting this thing in the wall in production and just letting it sit. Uh, and of course the change is these two capacitors stacked right in the middle of the heatsink. Uh, and what these do is they turn the original two pair resistors which were disconnected completely in the test run into a snubber network. Uh, so to help a uh, poor diode over here cable with the inductive spike coming out of the uh, heater, uh, these guys will conduct just when the voltage is rapidly rising or rac rapidly decreasing. 
bypassing current freeways resistors. Uh, and this has two effects. Uh, it's connected in parallel with the uh, biggest number, uh, and it's uh, and as such, it will also trigger when the circuit triggers. So, if we have a rising voltage across the input terminals, uh, when a rapidly rising voltage, uh, when the MPPT controller has gone into sweep mode, uh, we will have a rapidly increase in voltage over the capacitor. It will conduct. So these guys are going to conduct uh, as soon as the voltage ramps up, putting an 86 ohm load across the solar panel for the briefest amount of time until the capacitor is charged and we can't pass any more current. And then, uh, well, as soon as we've overcome the inductance in this thing, this thing will start conducting uh, and passing power for the remainder of the sweep or the continuous overload condition. And uh, when the controller has returned into MPPT tracking mode, when the array voltage has gone down, well, we'll have uh, this transistor gain open circuit uh, making the inductance and this thing want to keep pushing current and uh, causing a negative spike across here. Now, the diode is going to take care of most of it, uh, as uh, evidenced by this thing not blowing up uh, today. Uh, but uh, any remaining current is going to be passed and dissipated in these resistors and the capacitor, uh, giving this thing quite a nice bit of durability all around. These things can't blow up because they're AC coupled with 1.7 microfarads. They really only work for a super short amount of time, about one millisecond. And uh, the rest is handled by the big grill. Uh, and to top things off, I added an activity LED. So this guy's just connected straight across the load resist load resistors as well. Uh, and uh, it's going to light when there's current, pass current passing through this guy because uh, it, it will light when uh, this guy's passing current as well but it, that's just going to be for one millisecond so you wouldn't see the LED lighting in normal operation. Uh, but the importance of the LED is uh, it gives us feedback if uh, we are in MPPT mode and this transistor is shorted out. This thing will be uh, passing current all the time. The LED will be lit uh, in MPPT tracking mode and we'll know that something's gone wrong here uh, without having to measure around. Uh, and it will also tell us when in normal operation if this thing is dissipating power and limiting our uh, voltage uh, if the batteries are fully charged. So it's a fault LED as well as a battery fully charged or low load on the solar panel indicator. All right, so here is our equivalent circuit. And it looks a bit convoluted, but it's real enough. So let's go through the components. Uh, on the right here, we have our solar panel, which is simulated by a 156 volt uh, source and a 5 ohm resistor. And this should be reasonably close to the panel I actually have under full sunlight. In the middle, we have our uh, control circuit. And this is our convection heater. And all the way over here, we have our simulated MPPT controller, uh, which we can control with the potentiometer. Uh, and we can also control the sun by adjusting the uh, solar panel input voltage. So uh, in normal operation, we're looking right now at a sunny day where we're pulling out about 920 watts. It's a really good day. Uh, and uh, we have a panel voltage of about 113 volts. Uh, on these two graphs, we have the two power shunting resistors. This is the uh, snobber, uh, which is uh, AC coupled, and this is the big convection heater. So we are simulating at a very slow rate. You can see about one millisecond per second. So we can use this control to simulate an MPPT sweep, because if we pull this all the way to the left, you can see our consumed power from the MPPT controller goes down to 21 watts. It's basically open circuit. Uh, and we can also simulate a more brutal switching off of the controller with this switch because that just slams it. Zero current. Uh, so let's uh, simulate a normal sweep. And we can do that by using this glitch, moving our mouse over here. So when I put the mouse cursor back into the MPPT slider, it's going to slam into the maximum range. 
uh, and uh, the controller is going to go open circuit. So let's see what happens. Slam, and we're doing our sweep, and we're back in producing power. So you can see the curves for the two resistors are quite different. The snobber, which is the right of the white traces, uh, just has, get a small pulse of current when the voltage is just spiking up. Whereas the left uh, trace, which is the big resistor, it just gets a much slower response. And uh, this is exactly what we want to see. Uh, so when I was running the circuit today, I did notice our maximum open circuit voltage was a bit higher than before I added the convection heater. And uh, that's gonna be because we have quite a bit of inductance in the convection heater to take care of, and that makes it slow. You can see that on this trace, where it takes just a moment to get up to maximum power. And we're compensating for that with a very sharp, quick, smaller resistor here, which is AC coupled. Uh, so our load on the solar panel is pretty much instant. You can see on this trace that there's no tiny spike in the beginning. And again, we're simulating this very, very slowly. So if there was even the tiniest spike, we would see that. Now there is one scenario where this might uh, go wrong and we do risk exploding our switching transistor here. Maybe, depending on the quality of the transistor, because if we have a fully charged battery and a kind of slightly set sun, like that, we've just brought down the panel voltage ever so slightly, uh, the transistor can go into a state which is just kind of half on. Just about here, around 136, 137 volts on the panel. And if we keep, well, like right now we are charging our batteries, drawing less and less current. So we're loading our panel down less and less. The voltage is going up. And uh, right about here, we're at about 50% load on this power resistor, which means but our switching transistor is only half on. It's in its linear region and it's uh, dissipating quite a lot of power. Over the mouse over there, we have a voltage drop of about 50 volts and a forward current of about uh, 700 milliamps. And uh, in the simulations, we can end up with a worst case power dissipation of about 30 to 40 watts in this transistor, which is within its specification, but it, uh, does not like it. The switching type of uh, cheapo FETs do not like operating in the linear region. They just uh, get internal hotspots and usually explode after a while. Uh, so I'm just kind of praying that we're not going to end up at this particular uh, panel voltage ever. Uh, we have a very narrow panel voltage range where this is a problem because uh, if this is close to the maximum power dissipation, like so, or at low power dissipation, that's not a problem. It's only an issue when we have a very low MPPT load and kind of medium sunlight. So this is somewhat dark outside and we are at just an 8-bit power of 20 watts, so the battery is almost completely fully charged. Uh, and we have to go to, that's like a 20 watt output voltage. 8 bit power range and a very narrow input voltage range that puts us in this area uh, of about, it's about between 136 and 137 volts that uh, we have this problem of the switching transistor being in this linear region. So I'm just kind of hoping that uh, we're never going to sit there for a prolonged period of time. It's, it's just a rather rare uh, circumstance. And if this transistor were to fail, uh, all that would happen is that. Uh, uh, it would be the same as this. Uh, it's just always on and the convector heater becomes permanently connected to the circuit and wasting about 170 watts of our solar panel. The red LED on the front would light and uh, I would hopefully notice it uh, somewhat expediently and uh, take care of a problem, probably ordering a proper linear rated FET for doing this duty over here. 
But huh, that's another theory. I'm gonna try and link the circuit uh, in the description so you can play around with it if you want. And I'll get to putting this thing in place. We can actually really demonstrate the efficacy of the snubber circuit by having this thing hooked up and abusing it a tiny bit. So we have 150 volts DC in these leads and we can we can grab them like that, get them in focus and just that's breaking 1.2 amps to 150 volts DC with uh, no arcing no arcing at all. If we look at the power supply we are breaking that current beautifully and if I were to do this with uh, just the uh, convective heater it would make a proper big spark. It made like a two millimeter spark when I tried it off camera. Uh, so this means our circuit is working just fine and if we clamp that on, try and not short circuit that and turn this down, it's hopefully not exploded. Nope, it still works just fine. No problems at all. Beautiful. Alright, it's now nice and sunny outside and I've got the lights turned off down here with a shunt mounted on the wall with some nice documentation on the side. Now you can just start to see the activity LED going off there when it happens to be in focus. And it's been sitting like this. Jeez, do something. It's been sitting like this all day and it hasn't gone on fire yet. Uh, so I would wager this device is going to do its job. Uh, in the logs we have uh, nothing to suggest the array would have been out of spec. The peak voltage uh, on the sweep has been a bit lower than before. We only have one high array current limit uh, warning, uh, which is uh, a lot less than we saw uh, earlier, actually, uh, when it was in its previous iteration, we'd get like 10 high array voltage current limit warnings per day. So I'm quite happy about this. I don't think it's going to fail. All right, so it's now a nice, bright, sunny day. And our solar system has very limited load on it. We're just drawing 176 watts to float charge for batteries. And you can see our array voltage and array VOC are at about 140 volts. 138.9 means the shunt should just about be clipping the voltage. And the VOC of 140.78 that's a bit lower than it used to be. It used to go to about 142. Uh, and that means that our new snubber system is working good. And it's clipping that little spike I was getting before when it was starting the sweep. So let's head downstairs and have a look at what's going on. And well, there's the shunt. Uh, but I don't know what's happened with the LED. Uh, because I think that broke while I was upstairs shooting the previous segment. It was shining nice and bright just a couple of minutes ago, but now it's dead. So maybe one of the resistors went open circuit or maybe it's just a bad connection. But uh, regardless, I promise you the shunt is working. It's uh, producing a, uh, a small amount of heat and the voltage is being clamped as it should. And well, if we had the LED, uh, you would have seen it uh, modulating and keeping the voltage at a steady pace, the LED was kind of flickering on and off as the shunt was regulating. But that's probably going to get to stay there for quite a while to mount it. I've just drilled a couple of holes and put a couple of tiny screws in the concrete wall. This thing weighs like one kilo, so it's no bother having it mounted. And the original power lead for the uh, heater just goes straight into the so a array connector straight across the uh, Morningstar MPPT controller. So if I hold my hand right here above the heat sink, I can feel a bit of heat coming off of that. So the transistors are putting it of some power. Uh, and if I go over here, this it's warmer than ambient. Uh, it like if I hold my hand on on this metal, it's uh, 
cooler than uh, up on top where there's a warm air really flowing through. So this thing is doing its job, it's shunting not too much power actually, I was expecting it to uh, get warmer and run closer to its uh, uh, nominal power of about uh, 200 watts. Uh, but uh, that doesn't seem to be the case, but it obviously is working because otherwise the um, uh, uh, TriStar would be throwing an angry LED at us right now and being in uh, a high voltage limit mode. So this thing is working even though I somehow screwed up the LED circuit. Gosh. I managed to build this circuit, can't get the two resistors and an LED set up properly. Oh well. I actually really don't know why this would have failed. It's got two resistors which should handle the voltage just fine. It was set to just two milliamps. So it shouldn't have burned the LED. There shouldn't be any inductive reverse spike across this which could harm the LED and even so it's across a really high value resistor. Hmm. Maybe it was just a bad LED or bad, res bad cheap, terrible eBay resistors. Well, it actually seems that the shunt LED works, it's just that uh, it really only turns on when it's shunting quite a lot of power. So, uh, if we turn off one of the batteries uh, to reduce the one ampish load it's putting on the regulator, we should see a bit of a blip here. Let's go. There you go. So now there's so little load on the solar array that uh, the shunt is activating in order to uh, regulate the panel voltage. Now why it's uh, oscillating like that, I don't know. Probably the MPPT tracker being just a little bit unstable with this weird scenario it's facing right now. But nevertheless, the LED works and if this were to go into full shunting, uh, it would light steadily. Okay, well, yeah, that's the uh, variable morning star. VAC limiter that clamps at about 138 volts to let me run four series panels with the TriStar TS MPPT60 with eight running into high voltage array disconnect. So, thank you for watching. Cheerio. Something just that just uh, keeps impressing me with these uh, uh, Sun and Shine gel cell batteries is we have. 1500, 1500 amp hours of 10 year old lead acid batteries in the basement. And uh, what's our float charge current? I don't know, 400 milliamps. That's also about 100 milliamps going into powering a Wi Fi hotspot. So we're talking about like 10 watts per battery, battery bank. To float charge from that's insane, especially given the age of these guys.